Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to KubeCon. And thanks for coming to my talk. Today, we're going to talk about something interesting about streaming data processing. My name is Derek Wong. My body, Vijay Maras, is supposed to be here, but uh, he has some last minute change, he cannot make it. Both Vijay and I are principal engineers working for Intuit. And we are the project leads of our open source project, Numa Flow. I personally also the project lead our CNCF graduate project Argo events. Uh, here's today's agenda. We're going to start with a brief introduction about our employer Intuit, and then we're going to talk about streaming data processing, uh, its benefits and use cases, and we're gonna, also going to talk about the challenges we experienced when we use streaming technology to build our system platform and then give our solutions, our open source project, Numa Flow, followed by a live demo. And then in the end, I'm going to take questions. Start with the introduction about Intuit. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with uh, Intuit. But Intuit is a, a well-known uh, fintech company, which is based in North America, because we have some very famous products. TurboDAX, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and MailChimp. The TurboDAX is, is the most popular uh, tax returning filing tool. Almost everyone knows about it in North America. And all these major products are actually powered by our five key platform areas. These five key platform areas make sure we deliver value to our customers and accelerate innovations consistently across our organization. And with 100% of our service running on a Kubernetes-based modern SaaS platform. We are enabling billions of machine learning predictions to billions of dollars movement across our systems with the secure and smart approach. Intuit is also a very large open source community player. We do not only use open source technology to build our platforms, build our services, we also contribute a lot to open source community. As many of you know, Intuit is a creator of Argo which is one of the most popular CNCF graduate project. We also got two times CNCF and user award in 2019 and 2022. And more than that, we actually open source a lot of projects. Some of them are listed here. And the one we're going to talk about today is called NumaFlow, which is a, a Kubernetes native stream data processing platform, the one with a, a Polar Bear icon. Okay. Uh, Finishing all these introductions, let's move on to talk about streaming data processing. Before doing that, I would like to ask you some questions. How many of you actually uh, are data engineers or ever worked on data processing? If you don't mind, can you raise your hand? Quite a lot. Okay. And how many of you uh, actually are doing or ever done streaming data processing? Also, so many. Okay. So I'm very glad that uh, I mean, there are so many data engineers and non-data engineers coming uh, here for this talk, and I hope we can learn from each other. So what is streaming data processing? Stream data processing is a technology that continuously generates data, process data, and analyze data from various data sources in real time or near real time. So streaming data is processed as the time is generated. It's quite different from traditional data processing. This traditional data processing system they actually capture data in a central data warehouse and process data in groups or batches. So those traditional systems were built to ingest data, structure data before analytics, right? However, the nature of enterprise data is analyst. There's no bound for those data. Those are, those are streaming data, so which means Generating data volumes for those streaming data source could be very large. That makes, that makes it no way to use traditional batch processing technology to use real-time the streaming analytics, right? And that's one of the reasons why uh, in the past year, the streaming data processing platform has started to evolve. So uh, imagine you have an IoT application or you have some sensor data. Uh, you are using tools like a Kafka, Kinesis, or Pulsar to process data you are most probably doing streaming data processing. Why is streaming processing so important? So a lot of people are actually interested in streaming data processing because it has many benefits. It gives you insight quickly about what's happening in your systems with the 
so that you can make quick decisions. It brings you better user experience. It makes your business activity more efficient. Or imagine you are building an application like Uber, Lyft, or any uh, navigation system. You really want to know what happened in the past minutes or even seconds. Or you're building some system like anomaly detection. You really want to quickly detect if there are any um, problem with your services so that you can take quick actions. Or you're building some fraud detection platform. You want to protect your customer from any data loss or you know, money loss in a short period of time, right? To build this kind of system to achieve these kind of goals, you really need to use streaming data processing technologies. And on the other hand, a lot of people think streaming data is, or streaming data processing is only the job of data engineers. But actually, it's not right. Even you're not using tools like a Kafka, Kinesis to store those data, but think about it. Your application keeps generating data and keeps generating logs and metrics all day long. That never ends. Right? Your customers keep booking hotels, flights from your booking system, or your customers actually placing orders from your shopping system. Those, those kind of data keeps coming to your system. It never ends. Those are all streaming data. So that's why we, why we said uh, streaming data is actually for everyone. Streaming data processing. Uh, streaming data is everywhere, and streaming data processing is for everyone. And we talk about streaming data processing and its benefits and use cases. But actually, doing streaming, real-time streaming process is not easy. We have been using uh, streaming technology to build a lot of systems and platforms. And we actually experience a lot of challenges. One of the systems we, we have built is a anomaly detection platform, which is used, uh, used to detect the anomaly of the, of the application running Kubernetes clusters by applying the metrics emitted by those applications, such as latency, error rate, or any custom metrics, to apply those metrics to an AI machine learning model and to compute some anomaly scores. And then we use anomaly score to determine if your application is healthy or not, right? So this is a system actually uh, with the combined technology with streaming data process processing and the AI machine learning technologies. So the streaming, the metrics after streaming data keeps coming to our system. And we experienced a lot of challenges to build this system. The first challenge we experienced is there was actually lots of boilerplate code for streaming in every component. What that means is for the anomaly detection platform, we found our machine learning engineers spend a lot of time on writing code for streaming infrastructure. So for example, you can imagine for the best thing that a machine learning engineer can do is like to do some machine learning exploration and experiments. They actually found they actually need to write code to consume data from data sources like Kafka or any other data sources. And re they really need to figure out how to write a reliable code to do that. I found there are a lot of things like this. So that's the first big challenge for us. The second challenge we experienced is Without having a dedicated streaming data processing platform, you probably will end up with running your a streaming uh, platform with a collection of microservices. Right? So to be honest with you, uh, the normal detection platform we built at the beginning is actually running you know, some microservices to do that. And then actually, you know, we figured out you know, we really need to deal with a lot of ad hoc. So for example, you really need to figure out how to make those microservices running in a streaming fashion, you know, how to make those microservices like, uh, reliable and maintainable. So there are a lot of ad hoc you need to deal with. Let's assume you have microservice A and microservice B. You want to really figure out, you know, A calls B and B calls C, right? It's so like a streaming fashion. It's really hard to do that. So that's a second challenge for us. A third one is um, for the traditional architecture, it's really hard to do things like exper ex experimentation or ex exploration. So for example, for example, if you want to try a new uh, model for the nominal score generation, and you found it's really hard to uh, get it plugged into the microservice system. Or if you want to do some extra data enrichment or do some feature engineering, there's almost no way to do that for a live running system. So that's the third challenge we experienced. 
But this does not mean there is no existing streaming system exist, uh, available. So there are a lot, like Flink, and Spark Streams. They are all uh, very good streaming data processing platform. But the problem for this kind of system is they do centralized data processing. They are very costly and very heavy. So imagine that's not a system you can easily manage by yourself or install by yourself, right? You need to have a team, have maybe an organization to, to do that. And those kind of systems actually require a very steep learning curve, right? So it's not an easy managed system that I can use. Another problem with the existing system is like uh, almost most of the system actually is uh, JVM based, which means you need to use Java or Scala or those kind of language to write your data processing jobs. But think about it, it's really hard for, our data, uh, for our machine learning engineers for this anomaly detection platform. Python is the most, most popular language and the favorite language by the machine learning engineers. And, and uh, you know, Python is the language that built for the machine learning infrastructure and the library. And it's really hard for our machine learning to switch a different language like Java to write uh, the, the processing logic. And sometimes it's not about uh, how to learn to a different language, but actually there's no way to use Java to achieve some sort of machine learning because there's no available uh, infrastructure for machine learning for you know, Java language. Right? Another problem with the existing platform is uh, they're not Kubernetes native, which means they were not designed and built for Kubernetes, even though they can run on Kubernetes somehow. But for Kubernetes, we know the pod could be terminated or restarted very often due to many different kinds of reasons. You want to do node upgrade, you want to do a secure patch. So your service needs to be very resilient to those kind of Kubernetes lifecycle events. But systems like Flink, if there's a pod restart for this worker node, and then you really need to pass, the, pass your data person job to wait for the worker node to come back. And this is a big problem which means your streaming data processing platform cannot be running on the same infrastructure just like your regular uh, applications do. So those are challenges we experienced. And to address those challenges, solve this problem, we come up with the solution, which is our open source project called NumaFlow. So NumaFlow is a Kubernetes native streaming data processing platform. Here, Kubernetes native means we do not only run on Kubernetes, we also use Kubernetes native features to build the platform, which means you actually uh, can, you know, which means the NumaFlow actually is, is like a, uh, resilient to the Kubernetes native uh, lifecycle events like power restart, node upgrade, and then your data plan job will not be interrupted. Now, also means if you, are, if you know about Kubernetes and can easily use NumaFlow to run your data processing jobs to do stream data processing. It's a very lightweight and easy to use framework. You can install in your Kubernetes cluster, in cluster scope or running your own namespace. And it's also a language agnostic framework, which means you can use whatever language you want to use to write your data processing jobs. Meanwhile, I'll provide uh, SDKs for those different languages. Right now we have Java, Python, Golang, and Rust as support. And it's easy to uh, provide some other language support as well as the the common uh, GRPC interface are implemented. We also provide many building uh, source and syncs, which means you don't need to write any code to consume data or write data to common source and syncs like Kafka, NAS, Redis, et cetera. But meanwhile, you still have the flex flexibility to write your own user-defined stores, user-defined syncs. And all the scaling feature is out of the box supported. We support auto-scaling, auto-scale your workloads all the way down to zero if there's no traffic in your data processing pipeline. And scaling up to whatever number is needed based on traffic and load. And it's a full uh, streaming data processing feature provided platform. We support back pressure detecting, back pressure handling, and provide uh, watermark support, support out of the box. 
And because of all these features, we actually can achieve the cost reduced like uh, one third compared with the similar infrastructure running the same pipeline. And we have, we have some open source community users actually running NumaFlow in uh, some GPU devices which have no internet access. So it's very uh, lightweight structure. We talk about the basic feature of NumaFlow. Let's look at what is NumaFlow pipeline and how to use NumaFlow pipeline. And suppose you have a streaming data stream, a stream data source, and you want to do uh, some streaming data processing uh, for the data coming from the stream. And how are you going to do it with NumaFlow? In NumaFlow, we actually abstract all the data processing jobs to uh, a Kubernetes CR CRD object named pipeline. So each pipeline contains multiple data processing steps, and we name each step as a vertex. So for this particular use case, the first thing you need to do is come up with the source vertex. It depends on what kind of data source you have. You can use a, a built-in source vertex like Kafka, or you write your own data uh, user-defined source. And after having a source vertex, and what you need to do next is to add in some UDFs, UDF vertices. Here, UDF stands for uh, user-defined functions. And we support a map reduce out of the box. So which means you can have some map UDF, UDF vertex or have, uh, some you know, reduced UDF. So usually you do things like a data enrichment, data transformation, even map UDF. And for this use case, we also have a reduced UDF following the map one. So where you can do things like aggregation, aggregate by uh, some sort of keys by a period of time. And then in the end, you actually forward data, process data, some data sinks. And similar to the source, you can use a user-defined source. Okay, here, you can use a user-defined sync or your user-defined, I'm sorry, <laughs> the built-in sync or user-defined syncs. And NumaFlow has a very interesting feature called conditional forwarding, which means you actually can forward your data uh, to different downstream vertices when some sort of a condition is not met. So uh, here it shows the conditional forwarding to multiple syncs. And each box on this diagram is actually a vertex. And each vertex is nothing but a set of paths running your workload. So we auto scale the vertex for the different number of paths for each vertex. That's the auto scaling. And next, I'm going to go, do a demo. And if you want to try this demo by yourself, you actually can scan this QR code, and you, it, will lead you, it will lead you to um, GitHub repository where you can find all the source code, the steps to install, or um, the demo needed scripts. You will probably can do it by yourself in less than 10 minutes. So set up some context for the demo. Suppose you have a food delivery application, just like Uber Eats. I know Uber Eats is actually operational, operational in France. So you have some uh, streaming order coming from different uh, clients web browser or um, cell phone apps. So at the time your backend server is taking care of those uh, streaming orders, you, you also want to do some streaming analytics. You want to see uh, what are the most popular restaurants in the past one hour. Or you want to do something like, uh, uh, you know, what is the revenue of those restaurants? Uh, things like that, right? And then in the end, you want to uh, send the aggregated data back to another Kafka topic. So this is a very generic use case for streaming analytics. You actually find a similar use case in different scenarios. To do this demo, I actually wrote a piece of code to simulate the order of streaming order, which is publishing the order information to a Kafka topic. And then I, I created a new flow pipeline to do uh, the, the analysis. And then uh, in the NumaFlow pipeline, we're actually doing some data enrichment and data aggregation and things like that. If we look at the pipeline topology, so I'm going to have a, a source vertex, which is used to consume data from the Kafka topic. And then have an enrichment vertex to add some missing information or any information is needed for the analysis. And then do the aggregation. 
and in the end, sent to uh, Kafka scene. And quickly look into the, um, the data transformation for this demo. So this is a raw uh, order information, and there's an ID for this order information. It's a JSON format okay, for this particular data. There's an order ID in the restaurant ID, and the order time. And there's some dishes that customer order. Somehow, uh, the dish price is not in the order information. So in the enrichment step, actually adding the dish price into uh, the data. And because I want to do uh, aggregation per restaurant, right? So it would be better to show the restaurant name instead of, instead of the restaurant ID. So also add the restaurant name into the order information. And this is the aggregated data. So you can see there's a window start time, a window end time. And there's a restaurant name, how many orders, and what's the revenue uh, coming from uh, the aggregation. Now, let me go to the demo. To do this demo, I already pre-installed uh, the NemaFlow controller in my local cluster. I'm actually running a uh, I'm running a K3D cluster on my laptop. You can, you can actually run this demo in whatever Kubernetes cluster you want to do. And I already got the pipeline created before I came to the stage. So you can see there's actually a Kafka service I'm running in my local namespace. And also, I have an order gen, which is a piece of code I mentioned earlier, which is used to simulate the order, a streaming order. So if you take a look at the uh, logs, so we are actually uh, generating some streaming orders in the order information is like the order ID, restaurant ID, right? Just like the one we just look in, uh, we, we just look in, in the slides. And now if, I will go to our UI coming from uh, NumaFlow. NumaFlow provides a, a very fancy UI, something like this. You actually can uh, check the cluster view, namespace view for the pipelines. And I create the names, I'll create the pipeline in the uh, default namespace. If I click default, uh, you're going to see there's a pipeline running. It's called uh, order analysis. And if you want to create a NumaFlow pipeline, you actually click the button right here and, and put the your pipeline spec, and then you do a submit. So uh, there's some other option you can do from this UI. There's a pause, and there's a delete pipeline, there's this kind of operation for existing pipeline. If you click this button, you're going to see the pipeline topology for this other order analysis. Uh, there's in, which is used to uh, consume data from a Kafka topic which is on my laptop. And there's an enrichment aggregation and to do this demo, I actually create two things for this pipeline. One is used to write the data to um, a Kafka. So if you can see the spec, I'm actually writing um, the aggregate data to another topic and then my topic output. I also have the lock sync, which is also a building sync, which is used to print the, uh, print the data in the system log so that we can easily check. We don't need to go to check the Kafka data over there, right? So if if you look at this pipeline, I'm actually printing out the enrichment uh, orders for each uh, order received from the Kafka topic. So you can see for the enriched order, you can see there's order information and there's a um, dish price. Right? And there's a, a restaurant name, which is added to the order information. And if you look into uh, the lock sync and we can see the aggregated log, aggregate information is something like this. There's a window start time, window end time, and restaurant name, how many orders, total amount, just like we uh, expected at the beginning. And then we're seeing um, for same aggregation window, we're seeing the, uh, the aggregate data for different restaurants. Okay. If we go back to the pipeline, we're actually seeing some other information for, this, for, uh, for the streaming data processing pipeline you're seeing. The average processing rate for one minute, five minutes, and 15 minutes. We're also showing uh, the watermark 
And is there any back pressure for this pipeline showing the pending message in the backlog? It's pretty, pretty powerful uh, UI provided by Nimaflow. And then back to uh, the slides. And quickly look at the pipeline uh, spec. As I mentioned earlier, we have a, a vertices in a pipeline CRD definition. And for this pipeline, we have uh, in enrichment or aggregation and output. We actually have two, uh, two things I didn't mention in this, uh, in this slides. And the second major section for a pipeline CRD object is called edge, which is used to define uh, the relationship between those vertices. And the last piece of the, of the demo is let's look at the source code or the source code needed for this demo. Only these two pieces. So one is for the enrichment. And we're seeing there's a function called enrich. And we are adding some uh, information like a restaurant name for the, each data received. And returning, uh, we also add the uh, dish price here. And returning uh, a list of messages. And if you look at this function, it's very generic. You're, you're not seeing any upstream or downstream vertices. You're not seeing any source and things. You only see uh, there is a mapper.data. It's like uh, the data received for this particular uh, enrichment of vertex. And this, this is actually the most powerful part for NumaFlow that you don't need to care about all those upstream and downstream. The platform will take care of all the things for you. You don't need to worry about it. And one more piece of this enrichment code is like uh, we pay attention to the return message. We are actually doing the message returning with the, with the keys here because we, we know we're going to use the uh, restaurant as the group by keys in the next aggregation step. So returning the message with keys are like a restaurant name. And then on the right side is the aggregation code. Similarly, uh, there's a generic function provided for the aggregation feature, for the reduce feature. So you're getting a list of keys and you're getting um, a channel for the message you received. And this is a pseudo code. Uh, Within in Golang, so you're seeing channel, or if you're using some other SDK like Java, you're going to see something like the iterator or you know list, things like that. And there's some metadata and returning a list of reduced message. And we're getting the restaurant name from the keys, and for all the message from the channel, you do your for loop, and then you do some simple math, right, to calculate how many uh, orders in the total amount is so revenue. And then we return the reduced message as a JSON screen. We set the window start, window end, and restaurant name, order account, and total amount. And we're not seeing anything about uh, the upstream and downstream. Right? So this is like we are doing some sort of um, unit function unit for stream data processing. You don't need to care about what's your data source and data sync. You can easily switch the data source and data syncs to different, different types. You don't need to make any code change for that. You don't need to make any logic to your data processing pipeline. All right. So we just look at a demo. Um, I hope you, you, know, you know some idea about how NumaFlow to do extreme data processing to the stream analytics. And we just checked the uh, pipeline, which is like you know, line or tree, tree shift. And actually, um, it's much more powerful than that. So the first picture we are seeing here is like a, a multi, multiple source use case. So it's, suppose you have a multiple source. One is Kafka, another one is Pulsar, and they're in, they have similar data structure. You want to process that from these two different sources. You don't, instead of writing two pipelines, you actually combine both sources into one pipeline. And the second picture actually uh, shows a joining use case. Joining is like you can uh, join multiple upstream vertex to uh, same downstream vertex, and we support a map joining or reduce joining. And, you, know, you can do either one. So this is like a fork and join use case, like a diamond shape, right? The third one is more interesting. It's like a, you can do cycling, which means you can uh, forward the data to yourself or someone in front of you. This is very useful when you do sort of um, reprocessing when some sort of conditions are met or 
something like a, a rich wine, right? And last picture, the fourth picture shows the side input support. The side input is something, um, if you're familiar with the Apache Beam, and you probably know about a side input, that you actually can broadcast the change for your screen processing unit for those kind of configuring changes, which is you know, not very uh, frequent to, to broadcast those kinds to your uh, stream processing unit without interruption your data processing pipeline. And this is something supporting Umafly as well. And now let's do take a look at the use cases. First one is streaming analytics for Numaflow. Uh, of course, I mean, the demo we just uh, did is actually streaming analytics. And second one is you know, ML ops. The example I mentioned earlier for uh, streaming uh, for anomaly detection, detection platform is actually an ML ops platform. We actually uh, get this running for Intuit across all of Intuit uh, IKS clusters. And of course, you can use it to do like event-driven applications. Your pipeline can consume data from data sources like Kafka, and of course, you can use, write your own data source, uh, user-defined source to consider from any data source you want to do. And some other information I want to share on how NemaFlow is used in the open source community. And a lot of people are using it to do anomaly detection. And one of the users, I think I mentioned earlier, that they're using NemaFlow to do digital digital signal processing, which is running NemaFlow in a GPU device, which has no internet access. We also run NemaFlow, run some Raspberry Pi, it's also working. And one of the use cases we have is actually our, our open source user actually running NemaFlow. Uh, it's actually a very large car manufacturer. I don't want to mention the name right here. But they're using NumaFlow to do uh, map data processing for their navigation system. And some data I can share here for Intuit. Uh, we have been doing like 5 billion message process each day, and we're doing 60 million machine learning predictions. And unified model fine tune is like 45K per day. In Twitter model, it's like 135K. Some of the information I can share here. So I think. It, um, that's all for my demo. If you are interested in this project, you actually can scan the large, the bigger one to go to our open source uh, GitHub repository. And the second one is the demo I just did. So if you are interested and want to run it by yourself, it's just to scan the bar code here. And now I'm taking questions. Thank you. Hey, hey go ahead. Uh, just a quick question: When you when you have those uh, inputs and outputs, those are the buffers inside of um, inside of the NumaFlow documentation. I just looked at. Yeah, you can actually find all those uh, information from our so document. It's 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 um, you mentioned the key at the output in in your example, and I, is that the buffer concept? So that buffer is like a key value store that you have somehow. When you pass the messages around from one step to the other, mm -hmm. so the keys uh, the keys are only used for when you want to do some aggregation, do some reduce feature, right? From for regular map operation, you, you actually don't need to do the keys. Uh, so, if you, but if you want to do a reduce for a group by sort of uh, fixed window, or sliding window, or session window, you want to group by uh, some sort of keys, or or you have you are not doing any keys, you, have, you just wanted to group by window, and then you don't need to have the keys. But if you want to group by keys. You need to give the keys uh, in the previous maps UDF. I'm not sure I answered your question. Not, not really, but okay. I have two questions. I hope it's okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Kafka in the example, mm -hmm. uh, but you also mentioned Pulsar. Um, is there any plan to support Pulsar natively? Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, right now, we, we actually have several different kind of uh, source support. One is 100% you know, native, which means the source code, for example, Kafka, the source code of consuming data from Kafka is actually embedded in, in the platform code, in NumaFlow source code. So that's 100% native support. And we also have a second layer of native support, which means we provide some sort of uh, source implementation, but you're going to use it as a sidecar container. 
And the other one is, is um, you actually write your own source code. You want, you want to process data from, a, from, for example, from a database. You don't know what kind of schema you have in your database table, right? So you have to write your own, uh, own uh, user-defined source to consume data for that. And for Pulsar, it's not, in the, it's not the first use case right now, but we can make it a native support. Yeah, and that would be great. Uh, second question, uh, you had NumaFlow in the same cluster as Kafka from what I understood. Um, is it possible to have uh, Kafka in one cluster and NumaFlow in different cluster completely decoupled? Yeah, of course. So we don't care about what, uh, where your Kafka is sitting. Uh, as long as a Kafka can be accessible from the NumaFlow uh, pipeline. I'll, I'll give you a hint why I'm asking. Uh, we use Pulsar. Uh, we would use auth for authentication, right? So just hinting into how would you handle having Pulsar cluster completely isolated. Right now, I would have a client. I would authenticate, and I could consume. I would be super curious to see how that could work with NumaFlow. Uh, uh, so you, you mentioned you have a Pulsar completely separate in one cluster. Yes. But where do you want to run your new pipeline? That's so on a separate cluster. A separate cluster. And they need to make sure there's some connectivity too. Yes. Yeah. I, I Just hinting in this. Uh, so maybe we'll comment in a repo. But it's really interesting uh, because maybe we don't want to use Pulsar functions. And that would be an interesting use case to use NumaFlow. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, we actually have Slack channel mentioning the GitHub repository. If you are interested in uh, use case or interesting, you know, by using NumaFlow to your use case, you're welcome to. Sure. Reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a question. So my understanding is that NumaFlow acts a bit as a Kafka Streams uh, application. So it consumes from an input topic and writes to an output topic. Would you confirm or? Um, I'm not... Uh, no, we are not using Kafka Stream. We are actually it's like a uh, so the NumaFlow pipeline is a. Uh, is a uh, you know have nothing to do with you know Kafka Stream. It's like uh, you actually can use it to consume whatever data you want to consume. Uh, Kafka just a uh, use because you know we into it. We have a lot of a uh, Kafka use case, and we so we provide a first uh, layer support for Kafka. So we provide native support for Kafka. You don't need to write any code to consume data from Kafka. And uh, what I, what I was what I wanted to say is like you're trying to like do what Kafka Stream does in a cloud native way. Like and and then like my question is basically for um, for the database. So for the aggregation function, do you have an internal database for the aggregation, or I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, <laughs> you're here. Oh, you mean for internal message transmission, or yeah, yeah. Okay, I got your question. So there are two, um, two layers of a data persistence for um, NumaFlow pipelines. We actually support exact once delivery symmetrics. I didn't mention that during the talk. We actually support that. So there are two layers of a persistence for running a NumaFlow pipeline. Uh, we have some, something called indexed buffer between each vertex. So um, all the message transmitting the pipeline, we actually persist in, uh, in the indexed buffer. Right now we're using and JStream, NAS JStream, someone mentioned that in the previous talk. We also use JStream to do that, but, it's, but actually it's a plugin. You can use whatever, um, you, know, you can use some other sort of ISB implementation to do that. That's the first level of pers persistence. For the particular reduced use case, uh, for reduce, we also, we also process data in each of the pod by using PVC. So when you come up with the, uh, when you come up with the, uh, I actually can show that in the, Spec here. Uh, when you put your aggregation step here, you actually need to provide a PVC or provide any other sort of uh, persistent solution. And you write directly on file system, or like do you have a layer? Uh, uh, I see in the file system. Right. So you, you don't have any kind of cache like for like large large scale data. Uh, yeah, so right now the throughput we support is around, you know, any, any throughput below 30K per second, you can use MiFLA to process. Thanks.
and, and also, like one, one other question, do you have Avro support for, for, for Kafka? I mean, ordering support? Avro, Avro. Avro schemas support. Avro. Oh, other schema support. You mean other type of data source or? Avro, Avro is just a modeling, like model. Uh, it's, if you have Avro schemas, if you can consume uh, data with Avro schemas. Oh, okay. So actually, we don't care about the, what kind of data, uh, data format in your in your data source. So in our platform, in our system, in the projects, actually, what we see is like bytes array. It's just binary. So uh, if you write your own user-defined functions, you, you actually need to be aware of what kind of data schema you're using. So we don't, we don't care about what kind of schema you're using. It's not. I just use a JSON as an example to uh, for a demo, but you can determine what kind of data format you want to use. Thanks. Any other questions? So, uh, small question. How do you define how you, um, what's your access point in the container? Because I assume you're not starting a new container for every element you have to process in your stream. But I don't see here any entry point of how this container should start. Like I see image and I see a lot of other all the parts, but how do you know which function to execute in a container, for example? Uh, we actually provide uh, some SDK support. Uh, so I actually can show you the source code for this demo. So this is a small uh, QR code I showed there. If you scan the QR code, you actually can see uh, all the source code for uh, this demo. If we go to, so there's a main function, which is the image I mentioned in, in the demo. So you are seeing we have a main function here, right? If it's enrich, we actually start the enrich function like this. So mapper don't use that's something we provided. So in the SDK. Or reduce we have a similar function. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, I have a question. If you uh, the whole pipeline exists in uh, one custom resource. Uh, is it correct? So if we want to add a new sync, uh, how does it work? Should we recreate all pipeline or? Uh, if we are adding uh, sync for existing pipeline. Uh -huh. So you actually want to change the topology for the pipeline, right? You want to, yeah. for example, you want to add a branch, you want to add a sync or add a source, right? Uh, I want to add a sync. You want to add a sync, you just yeah. change the pipeline spec and apply it again, that's it. Oh, okay. But uh, you, you actually, you know, it's, you know, my answer to this question is not 100% correct. Uh, it, it actually depends on what kind of uh, use case you have. So for example, you're actually adding some uh, new topology for the pipeline, but actually, or updating or removing some pipeline, uh, some, you know, nodes for, for the pipeline. It depends on if you have any uh, legacy data or backlog in the, in, in, the, in the pipeline. If you are new versus, actually does not recognize, they do not recognize the, the, uh, the backlog, the data, and then it's going to be a problem. So you need to make sure those kind of things are not a problem for you. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. I think we're out of time. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, I will stay here and we'll answer your questions over there. Okay, thank you.